And now, please let me introduce our featured guests. So tonight, joining us uh, through Zoom, uh, we have four guests who are going to be speaking about their experiences with um, Monsignor Lorenzo. We have Carlo and Monica Canetta, who are in the Boston area, uh, and the parents of five kids, six, uh, as their kids always remind them. Uh, Helen Whitney, the acclaimed documentarian and close personal friend of Lorenzo, uh, who uh, also is the main inspiration and reason for the why we have God at the Ritz, which is really a fantastic book. Uh, we have Stephen Adubato, who is a high school teacher in New Jersey. Um, and we have Tom Black, who has ha worn many hats and currently is saving lives in this pandemic as a paramedic in New York City. So uh, without further ado, I would actually like to begin by inviting Helen um, to join our conversation here and share about her first experience with Lorenzo um, and, and how she how he came to, to be in her life. Well, Lorenzo had, and I'm sure you all of you would say the same thing, uh, an outsized uh, influence in my life, not only professionally, which is how I met him, but um, spiritually, personally, emotionally, the full, the full Monty. But I met him through work. I, I make documentary uh, specials actually for PBS and I was asked to make a three hour portrait of John Paul II and I was in the midst of research that was going nowhere, I could, I, I, I was frustrated. I was, I was about to abandon the film. The man that people were talking about was either, you know, sentimentally pious and uninteresting, or just, you know, the hagiography of and superlatives from the right and the critique from the left. And I just thought, I've got to get out of here. Uh, this man, I'm not going to make a great film about him. And I think one of Lorenzo's closest friends, Michael Sean Winter, I think is his name, said to me, abandon no, not all hope. Just talk to this amazing man before you give up the film. And the rest is history. I placed a phone call to him. Three hours later, we were talking not only about the Pope, but the best place for a pastrami sandwich in the Lower East Side and, you know, our favorite books and Graham Greene and everything else. But I, at the end of that three hours, and this is, you know, Lorenzo's great gift to me throughout my work, of, you know, I really could. He, and in particular with the Pope, he enabled me to see a man of complexity and contradiction. And in some ways that's a portrait of, of Lorenzo himself. And, and, I, and those contradictions were fascinating. I mean, in that three hours, I saw a, a Pope who was both mystical to the core and rational to the core. I saw someone supremely political and knew, knew how to massage uh, media, uh, someone apolitical. I saw someone deeply empathic to the poor and to the abandoned and also someone absolutely tone deaf to the pain of gays and to victims of, of priest abuse. And, and the list could go on and on. And, and I left that three hours on the phone, you know, with, <laughs> with a date to see Lorenzo a week later for dinner. But I, I, it really, I went in search of Lorenzo's Pope for the next three years and traveled all across the world looking for him. And I think finding him in large part because Lorenzo had really opened me up as he always did and does to complexity and to nuance and, and to not be afraid of contradictions also that can coexist. Uh, so that was, that was a remarkable sort of work experience. And, and yes, God at the Ritz came out of it. <laughs> we went up to meet the, yeah, it's a tradition among um, all the television producers and executive producers that all the shows are brought to California and you speak, and if yours is chosen, you speak in front of an audience and you bring some people from the show. And 
you know, Lorenzo was the runaway hit. Um, everyone adored him. All the secular journalists just swarmed around him. And, and we sat up at night sort of ordering room service, endless room service. It was, it was and out of it came, came God the Ritz. Um, but then there were a few other, and I'm just going to single out sort of work because, you know, our, our friendship was much deeper and richer than that. But I think some of the ideas that he helped me grapple with will be of interest to people. Um, I was asked to make a, a four hour series on forgiveness. And once again, I was, for different reasons, baffled by the immensity of the subject. It was a big baggy subject and you know, it, it had been presented so often with sentimental pieties and new age, you know, certainties. It was, you know, and no one seemed to know what forgiveness was. Was it from God? Was it from man? Was it from a therapist's office? Was it conditional? Was it unconditional? Was it political? Was it personal? I mean, it, it was all over the place. and. I called Lorenzo late one night, and it was another one of those three hour phone calls. He was a night bird, as you know, oh, no. and he just nailed the show for me. He really did. I mean, his, first of all, his view of forgiveness was not the conventional sort of uh, one of, of, of most Monsignors. Uh, and he said, he said to me many things, uh, which really, you know, shape not only the film, but shape my, my life uh, in many ways. That forgiveness is, first of all, an ache in the human heart that precedes religion. Religion gives it expression, but it's, it precedes religion. It is that fear and terror that we have of going into the night. It's rooted in that, of going into the night unreconciled, unforgiven. And it comes out of that. And that was one sort of central insight as a way to sort of think about this big baggy idea. And, and, and the second one was that he affirmed my sense, again, this is not a conventional <laughs> view of, of, um, of a clerical man, but that forgiveness, while it can be the force for, a, you know, reconciliation and greatness and beauty, it also radical forgiveness and and radical unconditional forgiveness or premature forgiveness can be destructive and limited. And that was a very interesting idea, one that I explored with him. And we had a 40 minute segment on the Amish and he took a look at that story of which, you know, these Amish instantly forgave the neighbor who had killed 11 of their children in cold blood. And, and he didn't take anything away from the moral grandeur of their act, but he was able with that psychological complexity that he has to, to wonder about the psychological toll it took on them because it wasn't freely given, it was doctrinally mandated. And I just thought that was such an interesting, rich, complicated way to look at this enormous subject. It was, it was a great gift. He also, he didn't want to be in the film because he felt a little out of it, but he gave me a very interesting insight. And I had this four hour series on the Mormons and I was puzzling over their history and why, if you know anything about the Mormons and you know that in the 19th century, they were probably the most persecuted, the most despised, certainly American religion, uh, religion in America. And persecuted, hounded, and murdered. Um, and I can never kind of, I could understand the obvious ways that they could provoke and be a nuisance and, and also their claims to be the one true religion, but something else was going on. And he gave me two in classic lens away an idea of looking at, at, at that nut of the problem was, one is, and he, he quoted either, I can't remember, it's either a famous Sartre quote or, or Miller, Arthur Miller quote, everyone needs his Jew. In other words, universal bigotry. We're always looking. We are a lot more than that, but we, but that, that tendency to find the other, to push to the side. And he said, you know, Helen, you should probably look at the Mormons as our Jews on the frontier. And it, it kind of deepened that whole question for me, and it located it in a kind of very, in an existential uh, 
way. And then he had a very interesting insight about the literalness of the religion that drives people crazy. I mean, if, they, if there is a Mormon heresy, it is they haven't moved to metaphor and they look at God as oh, having a body and, and, and other gods uh, eating and drinking and there being an afterlife. And, and how this collapses, the sacred distance between man and God and how threatening that is. And, and again, that was just a fascinating insight. It really was. And you probably know uh, Lorenzo's presence in my films through the 9-11 film. Uh, faith and doubt at ground zero and very soon after the planes went into the building Lorenzo and I were on the telephone my, my, my apartment looks out on on the Twin Towers on the lower Manhattan and he said then on the phone to me and then we spent some time talking he said Helen religion drove those planes into the building and it was a very important insight and, and a way of shaping the questions of a of what became PBS's special on 9-11. And, and it was, you know, it was a film that, that again, with through the constant conversations with Lorenzo that explored the ways in which belief and unbelief were challenged by this horrific act. Uh, and, and asking the questions about not just where was God on 9-11, the usual theodicy questions, but, who is this God? And have we learned anything new about evil post 9-11? And then his most provocative insight was religion itself. And he, he posed the question in the film, he posed it throughout, and he certainly has spoken about it, you know, and the question being, is there something inherent in the spiritual quest that is dangerous? And he certainly, you know that kind of long 10 minute sort of almost aria he's saying to in the film to the beauty of religion and how it can be a force for good and greatness and kindness and art and wonder but how this lust for certainty and for the absolute can take you into very dark places and again you know was that unbelievable sort of you know that intellectual bravery of his and you know and pushing me always to search to ask for deeper, richer questions. And so those are the three sort of big films he shaped. And sadly, at the end of his life, I was making a film about mortality, about awakening to mortality. And, and you know, we, we did talk about the film, but he was far too sick and it was far too close to home for me to, you know, in, you know, in, introduce him into the film. But again, once again, he offered me insights uh, and quite startling ones. You know, he, he, he wasn't the first time he did this in many dinner parties at, at my house when my, my secular friends would crowd around him, he, asking him questions about the great consolations that religion offers. Uh, for death, he would say, no, I, I'm not here to console. Death is a tragedy. Um, we're not born to die. I'm not preaching acceptance. We're born to live. And in that courage to look at, you know, our fears of, of death is, was the yes to the resurrection. And it, it was, it was a, a, some of the most personal searching conversations I ever had with him were around this subject as in, in his last, in the last period of his life, it was so helpful. So anyway, those are, you know, just some of the big ideas that, that not only meant a great deal to the, to this, to the, to the films that uh, he was consultant on and, and interviewed in, but in, in my life as well. Um, he was, you know, so that's just one of the many ways that, that well, no, no, I, I thank you very much. And I, and I think that's a good transition because our next guest, Carla and Monica met him at, at, you know, at an early stage in their life, right? Before when they were college students and high school students and, uh, and those questions are burning alive at you at that age. So Carlo and Monica, can you tell us a little bit about your encounter with Lorenzo and how, uh, yeah, and how those questions revealed themselves in your relationship with him? 
Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So um, we met Lorenzo um, at the time. So I was studying in college. Um, I was studying to be an engineer at Columbia. And um, uh, Lorenzo would be um, giving different talks or, or coming to preach to the college students uh, at Columbia. And so uh, I first saw him speaking to, um, you know, to groups of people. But uh, where the friendship with him um, really was born and became a personal friendship was uh, later on when I was in grad school and um, with my, uh, you know, now wife, um, at the time we were in a, a kind of a tumultuous period of our life, um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, if we should get married. And um, during that time, I was, um, I was looking for a priest to, to speak with about my vocation. And, um, and so I, you know, I needed somebody like Lorenzo. Uh, and Lorenzo at the time was, again, he was giving a lot of um, talks. He was, he was, he had a lot of engagements and he was looking for somebody to drive him around because uh, he was afraid or uncomfortable to drive. So um, it was a perfect match. So basically um, I became his uh, unofficial chauffeur and um, I would take the train from Manhattan up to uh, uh, up to Yonkers and walk to his house because he had a car. He just wouldn't drive it. And uh, I would wait outside for him and then I, I would drive him places. And it was great because we would you know, sit in the car for hours and just talk. Um, and what, uh, what stuck with me, what was remarkable about him um, and those conversations was that nothing was um, too big a problem for him he nothing would scandalize him yes. um and if for the people that know learn so if you think about him um he would never apologize for the way he was i mean he was aware of his kind of his quirks his limits but he would never apologize because he i don't know it was like he knew that if he was made this way then then that was then that was what was good and what was true um, and so the result is that when you were with him, you felt like um, the way you were um, was good, was uh, the way you needed to be. And so um, in the friendship with him, it was um, what I discovered was just um, total freedom and total um, uh, ability to be myself with all my questions, with all my doubts, with, with all of me. So I'll say um, one of my uh, most memorable memories of Monsignor is when once I went to confession and uh, after a long, long confession, I remember for penance, he said, okay, Monica, your penance is you need to go um, downstairs, 42nd Street and Lexington, and you need to bring me that burrito with uh, uh, extra beans, sour cream on the side I'd like my uh, diet coke and uh, and be back so that I can absolve you and I remember I was like all right here we go I ran I did what I had to do I came back and um, and I'll never forget I'll never forget that that moment I'll never forget that confession so that was Monsignor and um, to be a little bit more serious also, I remember that uh, when we finally got engaged, um, it was Monsignor that um, gave us uh, the book by Karo Wetiwa, The Jeweler Shop, and he read it with us. And, and to this day, the book, this book accompanies us. You know, we read it over and over. And, um, and that for me was very, very important in the, you know, in this decision, in the journey that Carla and I took um, in order to, to discern our vocation and to decide to get married. It's the weight of those. We rings. were, um, <laughs> we, were um, we were doing a weekly catechesis in uh, you know at Columbia when I was in grad school. Um, so uh, it's um, called the School of Community. It's um, the the form of catechesis that the uh, people who are in community and liberation do, where they they read from. Um, some of the founder of Father Giussani's texts and, and they work on them together weekly. Um, so at some point I, we had the idea to invite Albacete to come um, and to our kind of uh, surprise, he, he said yes. And he started to come weekly to meet with us um, at Columbia. Um, and at the same time he was, right, he was, you know, somebody who went and spoke to big audiences. Um, and in our little weekly catechesis, we were three, maybe four each week 
to the point that I started to feel embarrassed. I felt bad that you know he was made the sacrifice to leave the house and come down and and uh, come meet with the three and four of us. Um, but it wasn't a problem for him. He loved it. He 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 loved to be with people, and um, uh, it didn't matter who you were, what you were doing. He had uh, he had an interest in each one of us, and that's what I felt when I was with him. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I would now like to invite Tom Black, and I'm getting better at the spotlighting thing so I can highlight who uh, is talking. But Tom, um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with, now your video is off, Tom, just so that you know this. Um, so I'm going to let you figure out how to do that. Um, All right, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, but we cannot see you yet. I don't know what's going on. I, I, I am assuming that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know it was off. <clears throat> do you want to try and get that on? I'll go to Steven Adubato is what I'll yeah. do. Just so that people can kind of see you when you talk and you can kind of try and figure that out. Um, so, Steven, you uh, you have a different experience in car. I mean, not necessarily in terms of when you or how old you were when you met Lorenzo, but you met him later in his um, in his life. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience meeting Lorenzo? Yeah, actually, I never met him in person, so my story is awesome. Different. Yeah, no. So I I do consider Monsignor Albacete a friend, even though I never met him in this life. I guess we can say, um, but primarily, I became friends with him through his friends, through them telling me stories about him, through reading his books, and I found that by piecing together all these um, all these tidbits from people and from his writings he became a real presence for me in my life. There have been so many situations when I think of one of these stories and I say, you know, Alba Sete would totally get the situation I'm in right now, or that he'd be laughing at me in whatever crisis that I'm in. Um, so it, it, the friendship is very much real in the sense that he, he's a friend who helps me to look at my life, to look at reality and to, to understand, you know, what am I really living now? And I would say the greatest gift that his friendship has given me is the awareness that Christianity allows us to be fully human. We don't have to reduce or censor anything. Um, we don't have to put on a pious facade. We have I think it's Steve that froze. let him work on that okay so here we go tom black now that we can see you did i get the video back up yeah you're on okay let's see how far i can get before i uh screw up the technicalities again um so i met uh lorenzo when i was in high school uh through some friends through co um and uh i i just remember the first couple of times seeing him, he was just the coolest guy. He was just the coolest guy. Like he would do stuff. Um, like I remember being at a meeting we were in, let's say like it was NYU, some auditorium or something. And he was just sitting there smoking a cigarette with the microphone like this, like smoking a cigarette, eating chips and listening to people. And like, it was absolutely, you would, you just wanted to be like that guy. You just wanted to be like him because, man, he was, as I grew older and I understood, because by the way, that intuition that I had in, in high school that this was the coolest guy was right, <laughs> right? And as I as I got to know him better and I, I got older, it, it was just really clear that he was super, super, super free. He was super free to um to be with you like some people have have uh, spoken about already but like to just live his his mess with you no problem it was no problem it wasn't a scandal your mess wasn't a scandal um <laughs> it was it was just really really easy um to hang out with him because you belong to him and he belonged to you. And if you were hanging out with him, he was hanging out with you. There was nothing else on his plate. Um, 
besides you. And um, yeah, I mean, and and there was a lot of mess too. There's a lot of mess in my life. There's a lot of mess in in his life. I mean, I remember he moved. We helped him move into his into his house in Yonkers, and um, it was myself and some friends, and you know, it was incredible the amount of books that we had to move. Just forget about the the other stuff, but just books and books and books. So much so that um, we actually, after we finished moving all the boxes in, he said, well, I need some place to put my books. Uh, can you build me some shelves? And we're like, yeah, you know, sure. He's like, today. <laughs> so we're like, uh, yeah, sure. So we we went down to Home Depot and we grabbed some, some, uh, some brackets and some, and some shelving. <laughs> we went back and we just filled his basement with shelves and great. There's the shelves. And he's like, are you going to put the books up for me? <laughs> put the books up on the shelves um, for him. And uh, I was just, it was really, really beautiful because Nothing was a problem. He, anything he needed, he asked for. Anything. And he, it was really easy for the state, for you to do the same thing with him. And so, I mean, we would talk about, I mean, I remember, you know, much like Carlo, I, I, at a certain point became uh, an unofficial chauffeur, um, driving him to priest retreats and this, that, and the other thing. And he loved it because um, he could smoke in my car and it was not a problem, right? So I remember um, very, very clearly, like, you know, you have the little ashtray, this is back in the old cars where you had ashtrays and it would be like full and he would push a cigarette in and one, you know, an old one would fall out and then he would light another one. And it was great. We <laughs> were just driving down and uh, we would talk, we talked about everything from, you know, uh, love life to to the Twin Towers to, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, is, it, is it right to torture somebody if you knew that there was going to be a bomb that they were going to let off? Or I mean, just the hypotheticals. I mean, anything. And it was. Um, it was really incredible because you were just so clearly clearly loved by him and when yeah like my experience of, of hanging out with Lorenzo was that you were his like whole world when you were with him and that you it's incredible it's just an incredible thing that you don't come up you you don't come upon enough in life but uh really really um Yeah, a real experience of friendship, of really not being alone. So, yeah, you and I visited him a lot those last days. You know, when he when he was really starting to get sick, and then when he yeah. was in the hospital, I remember it was not a big deal for him to call and say, um, "What are you doing tomorrow?" Yeah, <laughs> come, yeah, yeah. Come, come see me. See me. And I. I, that taught me so much, right? Because like you, you want to avoid, he never avoided expressing his need. It didn't matter how small or big it was, right? Right, he, right. Oh, come and see me and bring fried chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Stop at that place. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, Steven, it looks like you're back. So um, I'm going to highlight spotlight you but go ahead and uh and unmute yourself steven and i'm sorry that we got disconnected and hopefully this will work out can you hear me better now does it yeah. work okay so yeah no i mean i'm just to reiterate so i became friends with albacete after his passing and it was through his friends that he became my friend and again the biggest thing that i've discovered through this friendship is that you know in Christianity, we're allowed to live our humanity fully. Uh, we don't have to reduce anything. We don't have to censor anything. We don't have to put up the pious facade. We can just be ourselves, humans, in the relationship with Christ. 
And one of my favorite passages from God at the Ritz, um, which is not one that's mentioned very often, he tells this story about a woman who asked him, like, do you literally believe that the resurrection literally happened? That like, you know, and that our bodies are going to literally resurrect. And he says to her, um, I'm going to read just a little excerpt. So he says to her, um, my immediate reaction to the, to the question was to think about and to notice and feel my own body, which could be diplomatically said to have reached threatening dimensions. So obviously we know he was rather large. When I try to get up in the morning, I discover parts of my body because they hurt that I didn't even know were there. So in response to this question about the resurrection of the body as metaphor, I replied, my experience of the, bo of my, of the body is not the experience of a metaphor. The day this body becomes a metaphor, I'll be better equipped to answer your question. And he continues by reflecting on his experiences being on a beach in Southern California. And he says, you see many bodies that make you think of the resurrection as a worthwhile thing, as a metaphor for their beauty and attraction. What my heart wants is the real possibility of having a body like those who at the very moment, at that very moment could be seen around the pool uh, during the shooting of an episode of some television series. I have no idea what my risen body might look like, but if such a thing does exist, I want it to be closer to the bodies at the pool than to a metaphor. So it was these kinds of humorous theological insights that show how he was able to distill the particular paradox that is the incarnation. Because I mean, when you're talking about bodies, like for most people, I don't know, I always hear this kind of moralistic, like, oh, don't be vain, don't think too much about your body appearance. Or kind of sentimental, like, oh, it's only what matters on the inside. It's God doesn't care what's on the outside. But for him, for the with the faith in the incarnation, everything matters. Both the inside and the outside says something about God. It has to do with our desire for God. And that it's those kinds of insights that played a very key role in my own vocational path, but especially in my teaching. Um, I teach religion and philosophy to high school students in New Jersey. And I remember the summer after my first year as a teacher, which was a horror show, uh, I read God at the Ritz and it totally revolutionized the way that I teach um, because I felt more free to encourage my students to bring their humanity into our discussions about faith. Um, for many of them, they think that again, like religion is just something you have to be pious, you have to follow the rules, you erase your humanity, which is really just a waste of time. It's not interesting. And I remember after reading God at the, at the Ritz, we were, we were doing a lesson on John the Baptist and, you know, his, uh, the issue that he had with Herod. And I, I said to them, okay, so like they chopped off John the Baptist's head because he was, you know, claiming to speak the truth to Herod. And I said to him, like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? Like, why wouldn't he just shut his mouth and stop making a fuss about Herod so he could just not get his head chopped off? I mean, this guy's obviously crazy. And the kids were shocked that I was saying this. They're like, you're, you're a religion teacher. You can't say that John the Baptist is crazy. But I was like, no, he is. Obviously, if he's going to keep going until he gets his head chopped off, um, he's crazy. But this is what makes him interesting. Um, the fact that he went so far as to preach what he believed in and got his head chopped off. So even though he's crazy, at least there's something exciting about this guy. There's something interesting. You know, I want to know about him. So, so through reading uh, God at the Ritz, like it, it kind of allowed me to be free to say, yeah, Christianity is really weird. It's like not a normal religion at all. But that's what makes it exciting. It's I don't I mean I don't want a boring religion. So I mean that's one example, but a kind of a more meaningful example. Um, I found that the same way he became friends with me through his friends while he was alive, he became friends with one of my students through me. Um, there's this one student I had a few years ago who like utterly hated my guts. He thought I was horrible. He was miserable every time he came into my class. He never participated. But we were reading God at the Ritz during that time. And when we got to the, the unit in the book about suffering, um, this kid was really shocked by the chapter where Alba said to just keeps asking why, 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 why? Like, why do we have to suffer? Why, God, are you letting this happen? And the kid was shocked because he, like he said, you know, aren't you not supposed to question God? Like God gives you things, he lets things happen and you accept it. And I was like, well, why can't I question him? I mean, do you want to suffer? Like, don't, don't you want to know why this is happening? And he's like, yeah, but you can't say that. You can't ask God those questions. And I was like, look, if, 
if God promises me fulfillment, if Jesus is supposed to be this, uh, someone I'm supposed to give my life to, then I'm going to demand an answer, you know, because that's what I want. He's like, well, you can't get what you want. I was like, well, I want it. So I'm going to ask for it. And I wouldn't be able to, to say that to this kid to like kind of propose the importance of questioning in that way, if not for this relationship with Alba Sete. Um, and I just see, again, it's, nothing has to be censored. Like the fact of the incarnation allows us to be totally human and to bring our whole selves into the relationship. So that's a little bit about my growing friendship with uh, well, Vermont Senior. And, and, and you know, Stephen, I, I love that you learned that and you never met him because I think that's what a lot of us learn having met him, right? Um, I mean, I was, I was joking with my friend Camille, who's on this call, but um, around the Feast of the Epiphany or whatever, talking about how or maybe it's a presentation, Jesus is being presented and they buy two turtle doves because they don't have any money and they're poor. And all of a sudden I was like, what did they do with the goal the Magi gave them? We just talked about that. You know, like what did they do with the money? So I texted Camille and I was like, look, I had a very Albus at the insight. And she said, she was with our friend Wadi and he says, he gave a homily on this exact thing. He said, what did they do with the money? Um, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of experience of, and, and not only, by the way, of faith, right, but of, of all of reality, the, the science questions. When you see him with, with Hitchens, I always love that debate because Hitchens is like, either this guy is not religious or I'm not an atheist. Uh, he defied those categories. He was able to question in front of everything and without any fear and not 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 hold on to anything. And it's it's really, a, a, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time for questions. I don't know if there are questions out there, and I hope there are, and if there are, you send them to the moderator. But... Um, but it's, it's, it's really cool to, to hear in a lot of different experiences. And I, and I thank Helen, uh, for starting us off because, um, he was not a, uh, he was not a priest for pious, uh, people, right? He was a, he was a priest for the man on the street. He was a, a priest for the intellectual who was serious with their questions. And he was a priest for the young tumultuous uh, college students who were trying to figure out what their life might, you know, the direction their life might take, you know, or the chain smoking 22 year old was driving them around or whatever, you know, like uh, at the end of the day, there was no, there, there was no need to hide or, or censor anything when you were with him. He brought all of those things out. Uh, Joe, are, are there, have there any questions been sent or has anyone asked a question? Just uh, kind of the final thing, because otherwise, I will just thank our guests. Um.